Story time. I've never told this story to anyone. Ten years ago, I worked at a campsite in southern Colorado. It was not glamorous. Mostly cleaning out camping spots, hauling in firewood, and occasionally shouting at cars to slow down on the dirt trails to stop kicking up dust. It was during a particular low point of my life, just out college, when I was really broke, and in a bad spot with my family. I kept telling myself I just had to get through that summer, and everything would be fine. Some part of me knew that was always a lie. But hell, if you can't lie to yourself, sometimes then who can you lie to? The funny thing about it was I never really liked the woods. I had a bad experience camping as a kid with my family. We were up near Yellowstone, and I got stung by something I was allergic to. My entire leg swelled up like a red ham. On top of that my brother kept telling me stories of bears and mountain lions eating kids in that forest. So I spent the night just staring out the window, my leg throbbing in pain, waiting for something with bloody claws to leap out of the dark and chew me up. The only reason that I took the job is because a sweet elderly couple named Carl and Jenna Townsend who worked summers managing sites for the local forest service. They were customers as a grocery store in Durango, and could tell I was in a bad spot. Jenna mentioned they had an open role managing one of the camping sites, and it paid better than filling sacks of other people's food. She also said the mountain air would be good for me and that I could camp out for free in a spare RV. They already had up at this particular site. So whenever anyone asks me then about that summer, I mention all the good stuff. The beautiful sunsets in that high altitude alpine air, the mostly friendly gaggles of families that rolled in from all over the country, and the money I saved that allowed me to move back down to Texas and get a real job. If they are really pushy, I might share about the cougar incident or the loud truck from Oklahoma full of neo-Nazis who blasted terrible rock music at nights and threatened myself and several other campers with rifles when confronted. But I won't tell them about what occurred on the night of June 20th. I'm only telling you because it might happen again. I knew it was June 20th because one of the campers, a bright hippieish girl from Santa Fe, told me it was the summer solstice. It was the shortest night of the year in the Northern Hemisphere which meant it was the peak of summer before the days began growing shorter again through December. She was studying Indian petroglyphs in the region which were based on the solstice, and asked me if I wanted to join. I couldn't imagine anything more boring than that so I gently declined. But her excitement about this particular date stuck with me. When the sun began to set that evening, I noted it was pretty late, maybe around 10 o'clock at night. All of the campers in the site had arrived for the night, except one. So I was already back in my RV reading a book. The evening was strangely quiet. No loud kids on bikes or revving engines for once. Then, all at once, it became completely dark outside. I closed my book, pulling back the curtains. The night sky outside was pitch black. It was almost as if someone had hit a switch from dwindling evening sunlight to complete darkness. There hadn't been any sort of twilight at all. This didn't strike me as especially odd, as it was already past 10 at night, so it made sense to be night time. But even so I felt an off tingle between my shoulders. Something felt off, in how quickly it happened, in how dark it was now. I decided to do my single night sweep of the campsite now that I was already on edge. I opened the RV door and stepped outside, when I felt the feeling of oddness grow more pronounced. The air felt off, as if it had stopped moving. There was no breeze, no usual mountain nighttime coolness. It didn't feel hot or cold in fact. It felt like stepping into a vacuum. The second strange thing was how absolutely dark it was. This was occurring during a new moon wane, so the previous few nights had been darker than usual as well. But looking up I couldn't see a single star in the sky. Even more disturbing the light from my RV didn't seem to properly seep across the area around it. It seemed to stop dead, a few feet from the source, 
leaving the forest outside looking like formless void. And the final odd thing was the complete lack of sound. There is always a sound in the summer mountains, especially at night. Bugs chirping, birds cooing, sounds of campers getting ready for bed. But that night, I heard nothing outside of my own rustling. The cumulative effect was I was struck by the sudden, horrific certainty that right at that moment, I was the only person on this entire mountain, or maybe, in the entire world. There are many things a person might do, when finding themselves in such an unsettling situation. But the one I went with, was the shout out. Hello? No one responded. I leapt back into the RV to grab my phone, and a lamplight. Panic seizing me. My phone had no connection. But the lamplight worked. I flicked it on and jumped back outside, walking to the nearest campsite next to me. There I saw a parked RV with a Florida license plate. The same one belonging to the Masterson family I had checked in five hours before. But there were no Mastersons around. The RV sat in the still darkness, only revealing itself when I waved the lamplight directly over it. Hello, Mr. Miss, Miss Masterson. I called out again. I noticed the dark around me seemed to swallow the sound. No one responded. I hurried on, along the dirt driving trail, to each site. They were equally as still and empty, as if all the people on the mountain, except myself had simply vanished all at once. I was growing frantic now, running, tears forming on the edges of my eyes. And as my mental state got my scared, I noticed for the first time I could see other things inside the dark that surrounded me. At first I thought they were tears. Little creases in the dark, that ran like veins or roots across the greater hole. They had a slight glow to them, like luminous paint under black light. At first I wasn't sure I even saw them, but the more I raced through the camp, the more clearly I saw them. By now I had circled back to my RV, and was considering what to do next. What would make the most sense would be to get in my car and drive down the mountain to the main campsite run by Carl and Jenna Townsend. Except, some fear stayed me. What if I drove down there, and found the exact same thing? No people, no movement, no sound. Just me. All alone on this empty mountain. Forever. I sat down, realizing the little glowing tears were growing larger. I leaned in, staring at them, finding them beautiful in a way. I couldn't believe I hadn't seen them before. They were all around me all around the forest, and campsites, and my RV. They were in the walls. I wanted to keep looking at them, so I flicked off all the lights in the RV, and I realized they weren't tears at all. They were moving, squirming, like worms. They were in everything, on everything, alive somehow. And something, somewhere, was pushing at them, like a kid picking at a scab. I could feel its presence now, Surprised I had never been aware of it before. It felt big, much bigger than the mountain I was sitting on, its true enormity much larger than my mind could comprehend. I reached out, foolishly, trying to catch the glowing worms in my hand. I grasped, my hand floating through them, when I suddenly felt myself latched onto something like a fish on a hook. It yanked at me, and I was helpless. I was no longer in the RV, or the San Juan Mountains at all. I was in some place not real, and unreal, and I could see things as it drugged me along. It was a place of shapes and void. There was darkness and light, but also something different than both. Nothing had the forms we might be able to identify in this world. It was another world entirely, with an entirely different dimensional logic. I would probably have gone insane, except it happened too fast for me to really take in any of it. All I knew for certain was that I was a very, very small thing dangling near the jaws of a much larger thing. What saved me was a simple thought I'm still in the RV. I was convinced, certain, on some foundational level, that I was not on this other plane. I was somehow physically still where it started. In the safe little hovel, I had found myself in for the summer by chance 
thanks to the kindness of two strangers. And it was certainty in my own mind which saved me. The unreal vanished. Right before whatever had reeled me in could start to consume. And sure enough I found myself back in the RV. Not just where I was before, but how it was before. I flopped off my bed, in messy sweat, and saw it was no longer pitch black outside. The mountain sky was in the midst of purple twilight. I walked outside, shaking, and saw the Masterson kids playing right outside. I smelt campfires cooking all across the site, and could hear the normal settling sounds of nighttime rolling in. I tried to get my head around what I had experienced, but it seemed like babble now. I nearly wondered if I had drifted off to sleep, and if it had been a particularly awful dream. Except, I looked down at my hand, where I had touched the glowing, squirming worm mass. It was red and swollen, just as my leg had been all those years ago. And I remembered then something I had forgotten as a child. That it hadn't been a bug that had stung me at all. I had kicked at something glowing, pulsing in the woods. That day, I gently drove down to see Carl and Jenna, and apologetically asked to resign. I told them I was having too many bad dreams up in the mountains all alone, and they seemed to understand. I moved back to the Dallas area, and made it a rule to not spend nights in too quiet or too isolated areas. The loud city life has then been good to me. Until. Well, in the last few months I've started seeing them again. Wiggling, grappling in the night. On my bedroom walls. My bed. On my skin. And I feel it again. That great hulking mass. That thing trying to push through this veil of darkness from some other side. This past summer solstice was particularly bad again, and one day, I'm certain, it will find some way to reel me in as it has tried in the past, and I won't be able to stop it. So please be careful when you go out tonight. And every night. Especially on nights when the wall between the worlds is weakened by the pivots of our earth. Don't sleep alone. And if you see those glowing creases, do not reach out. Stay here, in this realm safe and sound. It all started out several months ago, when we moved into our new home, outside of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. I grew up in a rural community, but there were plenty of neighbors, and mostly fields around no woods. Given that I am the youngest child, my parent waited until I was done with high school to move, to not affect my already established life. Although we had always lived in a small, rural community, my parents were ready for something a little more secluded something with a lot of acreage, woods, and a place to shoot. They put my childhood home up on the market, and soon found their dream home, which is where I am currently, and desperately writing this story. The house and the property are beautiful. It's a large, turn-of-the-century house facing 15 acres of land, the majority of which are woods, and a nice half-acre pond. The best part, or so I thought, is that there are no neighbors within a mile of us. At first, I really enjoyed it. Being out in the woods was very much a cathartic experience for me. It helped shed the stresses of school and studying. Being among the tall trees, and the surrounding nature, made all of my problems seem totally insignificant. So I made a habit of going on regular walks through the woods, as the weeks went on, I started noticing strange things as I went on my walks. I would find partially eaten deer scattered along the leaf-littered ground, accompanied by a putrid, rotting smell, which I attributed to the carcass in front of me. At first, I thought nothing of it. It was probably coyotes, I would tell myself. Other than that, I thought nothing of it, but started carrying a gun with me on my walks in case. I encountered the animal that was responsible for the carnage I saw in front of me. As the days went on, I started noticing more and more mutilated deer scattered across the floor of the woods, still accompanied by the rotting smell, which I again attributed to the animals. If the increasing number of mutilations weren't enough, I started to notice a change in the sounds coming out of the woods. What was once a cacophony of sounds was now mostly dead silence, minus the low 
guttural growl that seemed to be becoming more prevalent, more pronounced, and more insidious each day. By this point, I had stopped going on my little walks. Gun or no gun, I didn't want to risk the chances of facing whatever was causing these events. That being said, my curiosity eventually got the best of me one night as I heard its growls. I decided that I was going to go get a trail cam and set it up out in the woods the following day in hopes of finally seeing what was out there. The next evening, after work, I gathered up what little courage I had left and, camera in hand, went walking out into the very woods I had promised myself I would stay out of. I never did get to set up the trail cam. I lost it somewhere in the woods, while I was in a panic, running for my life. I made it about 100 yards past the tree lines into the woods, where I decided to stop and set up the camera. I thought it was a good place to set it up, and, quite frankly, I was too scared to go any further. After all, I wanted to spend as little time out there as possible given the ongoing events, and the fact that it would be dark soon didn't help. Already on edge, every creak of the wood, and every crunch in the leaves sent me into a panic. Rushing to set the camera up, I drop it, sending it to the leaf-ridden ground with a thud, murmuring under my breath, cursing myself for being out there. I bent down to pick the camera up, when I started to smell that putrid smell of rotting flesh again. I carefully looked around, checking my surroundings to see if anything was out there. I could feel something watching me, but I couldn't see anything. Just as I was finishing picking my supplies off of the ground, I heard that low, guttural growl again, as well as the snap of a branch to my right. I quickly turned, seeing a human-like creature standing there, staring at me. I was completely frozen with fear. It had human features, standing on two legs, and it had feet and hands. The two things that threw me off, however, were the fact that its skin was charred black, as if it had been burnt in a fire, and most disturbingly, it had no upper or lower lips. Although mostly bald, a few thin, straggling hairs stuck every which way out of its scalp, with sharp teeth were hanging out like hypodermic needles. With the absence of lips, its raw, red gums hung out in the open. Thick strings of what appeared to be saliva dripped off of its chin, in a persistent stream. For one single, brief moment, the world around me seemed to stop. I quickly went through options on what to do. There were really only two viable options. Either stay exactly how I was, and get attacked and most likely killed by this thing, or I could get the hell out of there. I chose the latter. I quickly scrambled to my feet, and ran as fast as I could, throwing my camera, in vain, at the creature behind me. In the chaos of what had just occurred, I found myself to be momentarily lost after running in what I thought was the right direction for what felt like 20 minutes, but I'm sure it was only 30 seconds. Looking around and not seeing the spawn of hell that I had just encountered, I stopped to collect myself and try to find the way back to the house. I finally decided on the general direction in which I should head. When I heard a commotion that almost sounded like a horse pounding its hooves on the dirt, I looked behind me and saw that thing, whatever it was, running at me on all fours, mucus-like spit flying out of the corners of its mouth, like a rabid dog. I ran as quickly as I possibly could without daring to look behind me. Although I would not look at it, I could hear it galloping behind me and smell its rotted flesh. Tears ran down my eyes, as I thought that there was no way possible to make it out of the woods alive, when I finally saw the lights of my house out of the clearing. Using what little adrenaline I had left to sprint the 200 yards or so to my back porch, I quickly opened the door and slammed it shut not daring to look out the window. It's been about three months now since that happened. I haven't told anyone, and I will not dare to go back out in those woods. I've been doing a lot of research to see if I could find any clues as to what that thing might have been. I've exhausted myself, but I think I may have come to a conclusion. I know my sighting doesn't entirely match up with the stories I've heard, 
but it's the closest thing I've found. I was driving north on I-55 about a half mile south of the Route 10 overpass. This occurred last Wednesday, August 10th, around 11.15 p.m. This was, is in Upper Tangipahoa Parish. I was on my way home in Jackson, MS, about 100 yards ahead. I saw something crossing the highway from my left to right. When my headlights lightened it up, I swear I saw a walking lizard man. It walked like a human on its feet, and was greenish-brown shiny skin. The huge thick tail was prominent, and reached the roadway. The body was that of a man same arms, legs and head, maybe six feet tall. It swiftly crossed the highway. I lost track of it when I passed by. I still can't believe what I saw. After reading through all of these creepy, odd, and some absolutely horrifying campsite stories, I can't help but to add my two cents. Before I tell my story, I'd like to re-emphasize what many here have already brought up, which is that humans are the most dangerous animal to encounter in the woods. I began training to ride the entire Colorado Trail in March, 28-27 segments, 535 miles on a bike. I was new to bike packing, eager to try out all my new ultralight backpacking, bike packing gear. I attended a half a dozen free advanced mountain bike maintenance classes at the Bicycle Village. I initially started out going up for one night at a time, strictly on segment one of the CT, as that was the only segment not completely blanketed in snow in mid-March, and the trailhead is right by my house. As someone who has camped in Colorado for my entire life, solo camping on the CT in March can be risky business. If one doesn't spend much time in the back country, I try to play it safe. I hang my food, waste, I maintain a small fire, and cook at least 20 feet from where I pitch my tent, wash with soap and water before I ever get near where I sleep. I even keep an air horn, bear mace, tactical fixed blade knife, I have a bell on my frame bag etc. It was like the fifth or sixth time I went out, I can't remember but I was definitely excited because we had an irregularly hot St. Paddy's Day week, and a whole new section of the trail was accessible that was covered in snow and mud the previous weeks. So, I checked and rechecked all my gear made sure I had enough layers in case it dipped down into the teens and headed out from my apartment in Littleton. It's pretty awesome being able to ride from your front door and 45 minutes later, you are deep in the forest, even though I live in a pretty populated city. At any rate, I was new to the CT, and once I got past Bear Creek everything was brand new to me. It was perfect, the single track wasn't muddy, the birds were chirping. I came around one particular corner just past Bear Creek, and I saw a full suspension trek leaning up against a tree. How oh, that's curious. I kept on, and about 100 yards from the bike, I started to hear some sawing with a handsaw. Finally, I got to a clear section where I could see up ahead some ways, and there was a down tree blocking the trail, with a guy in his mid-fifties with long brown hair, a flannel shirt, and jeans was sawing the tree to clear the trail. He was a nice guy, said he'd been riding the trail for decades, and comes up every spring to clear the down trees. I helped him clear the big ass tree out. He had already done all the cutting, and I helped him pull all the sections off of the trail. He was very interested in my journey, my gear, and where I was heading. Not too interested, but as a MT beer, he seemed excited for me. I feel like now, in retrospect, I definitely told him too much information. Somehow while talking I told him I wasn't armed, where I was heading to, that I was new to the CT etc. He seemed like a genuinely good guy, and when a couple dudes are hauling logs together, it's easy to let your guard down while chit-chatting. As we are parting ways he tells me that there is a beautiful spot about quarter mile up the trail on the right. He said there was a campfire pit, and it was sheltered from the wind by these cliffs, and it had an amazing view of Waterton Canyon. I was tired after riding all the way from my apartment, 
hauling logs, and it was getting later in the afternoon so it sounded great. I followed his directions and found his site. He had even told me about some tools he leaves wrapped in a wax canvas bag under this cliff ledge. Surprisingly, I found it right after I set up my tent. It had a hand saw, a hatchet, hammer, and a few other hand tools. I used it to cut a bunch of wood to get me through the night, and put it back under the ledge where I found it. I ate a good dehydrated meal, followed up with some cherry cobbler, chilled by the fire, smoked a bowl, cleaned up and went to bed. The first few times sleeping alone in the forest were definitely scary, and I laid awake jumping at every sound the first night sleeping up there. But this was the fifth or sixth time, so I had started bringing up earplugs, so I could actually catch some Z's. I was sleeping, and something woke me right the F up. I don't know what it was, but it made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I found my headlamp popped my head out of my ray quarter dome. Nada. I put my clothes back on, and got out of the tent with my bear mace, and my fixed blade at the ready. I remember it was irregularly warm for mid-late March, but after something woke me up there was no wind, no sound nothing just still and silent. I looked around with two flashlights, and didn't see anything, no eyes, nothing. If I'm getting goosebumps typing this. I forgot to mention I also keep a personal jogging alarm that screams at 130 dB when you pull the pin. I pulled the pin to scare away anything that was near. I might not have heard it, but something definitely woke me up out of a dead sleep. While I was wearing earplugs. I can't really explain it. It is not logical. But right at that moment, after firing off the jogging alarm, something sent a wave of fear through my entire body. It was as if I was paralyzed for a minute or so. This was not my first time camping solo by any means, and it wasn't just in my head. Something freaked me out. If I was car camping, I would have thrown the entire tent, and all my shit in without breaking anything down and sped the F out of there. It's not that easy by kept packing I had to sit there and properly pack all of my gear, and make sure everything was balanced properly. It took me close to 15 minutes to get packed, and I was literally terrified the entire time, as if something or someone was watching me from close by. I finally got everything packed and started biking out of there, it was a little bit of downhill, and then about a mile and a half of harsh uphill single track riding, even harder with 23 pounds of extra gear, and in the middle of the night and terrified. So, I'm chugging it up the single track at like 2 in the morning in my easiest gear going slow F. I could actually see pretty well, though the moon wasn't full, but almost. I was about halfway up the last, really harsh incline before I got to the intersection at Lenny's Rest. After which it was all downhill all the way home, so I was really pushing harder than normal to get the rest. I was still scared, but it seemed to have subsided a bit due to the adrenaline from the cardio when all of the sudden, I hear something walking like four feet to my right, right off of the trail. I literally froze. I don't think I've ever been so scared in my entire life. It was steep there so I had no choice, but to jump off of my bike. I yelled as loud as I could, get the F out of here mother F, I will cut your throat. That didn't do anything and I heard whatever large animal, this was shifted its stance or something, and some twigs cracked. The forest was thick half off to my right, and I couldn't see five feet, whatever this thing was like four feet away. I couldn't see anything I started yelling, yo bear, over and over again as I started hiking my bike. It was too steep there to jump back on, and ride from a standstill, I had to get some momentum. I finally got enough momentum to get back on the bike, and I continued up the trail. I had to get off and hike a few more times, and at this point, I am screaming at the top of my lungs, because I keep hearing something walking really close to me. It almost sounded human. I finally get to Lenny's rest at the very tippy top of the hill, and I am exhausted from pushing myself so hard. I stopped to catch my breath at Lenny's rest. I didn't get off my bike but just stopped, and was holding myself up on Lenny's bench, 
and F me if I didn't hear something running uphill towards me from like 25 feet down the hill to my right that I just ascended. If anyone's ever been on segment 1 of the CT, you know that when you're heading back to Denver from Lenny's Rest, you know that it's like a launch pad with nothing but 7-4 miles of downhill, starting out steep with winding single track, switchbacks, and levels out. Once you get off of the single track and onto the water road, Something was running at me fast and fast uphill. I do not know what the F it was, whether it was human, cougar, or black bear. But I knew something was stalking me for the last hour. And I thought I was home free. When I got to Lenny's rest. So you can imagine how terrifying it was when I heard branches crunching loud. And something was literally running right at me. I took off down the single track faster than I have ever done in the daylight. In retrospect, this was so stupid, because there are literally cliffs on each corner of the switchbacks. And if I messed up even a little, I would have flown off of a cliff. I didn't give it F, and I was carving around the switches like a professional MTB racer. I was flying, but at one point about halfway down. I always have to get off the bike at this one really rocky spot with a boulder. I slowed down, and got off walked the bike around the corner got back on. And before I took off I got real quiet and listened. And no shit I could hear something up above me crashing down through the trees. Bypassing the normal trail and switchbacks, and just crashing straight down the mountain for me. I'd say whatever the F this thing was, was around 100 yards up the mountain from where I was. I hit it in high gear again, balls to the wall, didn't stop again, didn't look back. Breaking land speed records from that point all the way down until I was on Wadsworth Belvedere. This happened roughly around the year 2006. I was around 11 years old. I was in Richard D. Hubbard Elementary School, located in East Berlin, Connecticut. Every recess, my two female friends, and I would venture past the playground into the field. We would stick around the edge of the field, along a fence that borders some woods and a pond. We were not allowed to go past the second light pole, so we would linger around that pole, talking, playing, and looking at the woods and pond. One day, it was either late spring or summer, because the canopy was green, and the temperature was mild. We were walking out to the pole as usual. I was absorbed in conversation. But before we got to the second pole, my friend said, Oh, look at that bird. As I scanned the woods, my other friend spotted it before me and was saying something like, wow, it's huge. Finally, I noticed it and it was huge. It was perched on a very thick sycamore tree limb and its talons nearly wrapped completely around the limb's circumference. It was so big, in fact, that it looked like someone cut it out and pasted it on a background that was too small. I immediately looked for its eyes. This is the first thing I always do when I encounter an animal. Any bragging aside, I'm a very good animal whisperer, if you will. And initial eye contact is very important for me to connect with any animal. But I could not find this thing's eyes, because they were evidently concealed by a face full of down or very fluffy, small feathers. I assumed it was the molting season, and it was losing its winter plumage because it seemed to be too large to be a baby bird of any kind. Its head was just like that of an owl's rounded, with an indented V on its forehead. I don't remember the exact colors, but it was modeled with typical bird of prey colors, not one solid color. I had only been looking at this bird for maybe five seconds, when there was a loud snap, and the limb it was resting on fell off the tree. I don't know if the bird had shifted its weight when we spotted it, or if this was just a coincidence. Well, when the limb came crashing down, all I saw was a blur as this bird struggled to stay airborne. I think one or both of my friends may have screamed, but I was just taking this all in. After that very brief blur of flapping, it flew mostly glided directly toward us. That's when my friends took off running, but I stayed watching it. I was not scared at all, just intrigued. I instinctively knew this bird was not in attack mode, but it was annoyed that we had disturbed it. 
but as my friends kept running, one of them was desperately calling out my name, and the other was anxiously shrieking because I had not moved. And as I watched it fly toward me, its yellow talons were outstretched as if to pounce. It really looked as if it was not going to stop. So I pulled away from my instincts and ran toward my friends, looking over my shoulder as I did. I distinctly remember the chill in the air, as its huge shadow fell upon me. But at the last second, it pulled its talons in and swerved back up over the tree line. And it was gone. Just like that. Now, while I was intrigued and grateful for having experienced this, I didn't think there was anything unusual about this. It was years later that I found out this couldn't have been any known species, as it was much too big even to be an abnormally large specimen of a known species. The wingspan was at least 10 feet, probably around 12 feet. Its height was harder to ascertain because I didn't have a good reference point when it was perched up in the tree, but I would say it was around 5 feet tall. If I had known this was not a known species, I would have kept a tighter hold on the memory. Another detail I remember is that I think I saw the center, not the tip of its beak amid all that fluff. If it was indeed the beak, then it had a yellow, owl-like beak. Now for a while, I thought there must be a great forest behind that fence, if there was such a big bird living there. But it turns out that it takes one minute to walk from the fence to some condominiums on the other side. I then tried to find the limb that fell and see if there were scratch marks on it. But I knew it would do little to prove anything. Discouraged. I went on Google Maps to find out what was in the direction it flew off to. I quickly found a place called Owl's Lair Cliff in Ragged Mountain State Park, which is in the exact direction it was heading. I was excited, but also realized that it has been so long, and it probably never lived around here anyway, because I doubt there would be enough food to sustain it. I've never heard any similar reports in CT, either. It happened in the 1980s in the White Mountains of New Hampshire in the Jackson area. It was actually a group of autistic children who were hiking with a couple of instructors on a mountain called Black Mountain. One of the youngsters, I think he was between 8 and 10 years old, got separated from the group. As they came off the mountain, they couldn't find the kid. The authorities sent up over 250 people to search. This is not a very big mountain. Black Mountain is only about 3D 200 feet. They couldn't find the child. A couple of interesting details about this. They didn't find the child that night. I think it was possibly another night also that he stayed on the mountain. Interestingly, even though they had all these people who were professionals, as far as search and rescue, it was a fireman from Marshfield, Massachusetts who ended up finding the boy. He was watching a television show. This is about 250 miles away. He had never done anything like this before. He watched the television, and the news show talked about the child. He, all of a sudden, he had an epiphany that he was going to be able to find the child. He drives up to Black Mountain in New Hampshire, climbs the mountain, and lo and behold, he finds the child. Later on, it was discovered that the child, who was autistic, he was able to communicate much better after this incident. They asked the child, how did you survive? Because the temperature plummeted way below 30 degrees. They were very worried that the child might not survive the night. He said that he had been to a part of the mountain where he was surrounded by this white light, and that the white light kept him warm, and he was fine. The interesting thing again is after this incident, he ended up actually becoming more cognizant and more communicative. Another interesting side note about this was the fireman from Marshfield. He had become a big hero after this. He was in the newspapers, etc. He ends up coming out and admitting that he was an arsonist that the police had been looking for in the southern part of Massachusetts. He had come out because he had felt a message from God and he was going to be able to find this child and his whole life would be around. I don't know if you ever heard of the case at all.
I was given your link by the local UFO community concerning Bigfoot sightings. Around 2001 or 22, I started working for the USPS as a rural letter carrier in Westminster. I had previously worked for Westinghouse at its Oceanic plant in Annapolis for 13 years before that. Northrop Grumman had purchased Westinghouse some years earlier. I was called to sign papers concerning my security clearance at Oceanic, after I had told them I had found a job with USPS. So after signing the papers and listening to their debrief I headed home. On Route 97 a female woman was attempting to flag me down for help. She looked like a member of my art group, so I pulled over. It was not the person I thought, but she said that a Bigfoot had grabbed her friend and taken her into the woods. Without thinking I went into the woods. About the time I realized it was exceptionally stupid to do so, I spotted the girl being carried. They were so far in front of me that I would not have said it was a Bigfoot. A few seconds later I spotted a military helicopter in the sky, and it was circling. It got lower, and I saw the crewman open the door and place a weapon on a mount. I had picked up a large stick. I tested its strength on a side of the tree, and needed to pick up another. After picking up the second stick, I could see the crewman point at me, and whatever was carrying the girl. I became very frightened almost to the point I wanted to run. However, within seconds a blonde girl, who was naked from the waist down, came running towards me. She rushed past me and continued running. I know the copter was following whatever had grabbed the girl. When I made it back to the road, Maryland state troopers had pulled over. The blonde girl was so frightened, she ran out to her friend in the car. She was still naked from the waist down. On my way back, I spotted her clothing and picked it up. The police detained us at the location. I listened to the girls tell their version, but later I was sent to my vehicle. Two troopers asked what had happened separately. Later one of the troopers came to my vehicle and said, your people want you to leave now. He made other comments suggesting I was still in the military. I am a former Marine and cut my hair very short. I used to work out at Cho's Hap Kai Du from 1985 till 1993 or 92 nonstop. I had a sparring partner who we later learned was an FBI agent. He had told us he worked for Social Security. I picked him up from where he said he worked on several occasions before class. After we found a weapon in his bag, he said he was an FBI agent. He stopped coming to class after that. Well, he showed up a few days after the Bigfoot incident and said that I had spotted a biker, survivalist who was wanted by the authorities. He was indeed a huge man over six feet tall and ugly as hell, and he was not a Bigfoot. I told them I was too far away to get a good look at it. Whatever was carrying the girl had shoulders so wide that the girl's waist could easily fit between his shoulder muscles and his neck with gaps on both sides. This implied that whoever was carrying her was seven to eight feet tall. I grew up in Randallstown, and we had heard the Sykesville monster stories. I've heard tree knocks almost every time I entered the woods as a youth. I did not know about tree knocks until a few years ago. I also delivered mail at the Woodstock PO for about two years. Several of the customers claimed to have seen Bigfoot. When I was delivering back, then there was a prime ape sanctuary. I know of one incident when numerous federal authorities were at that location because of a series of Bigfoot sightings. They blamed the sanctuary for allowing one of the apes to escape and not notifying the authorities. I still technically work for ASPS in Westminster. I am in a non-pay status, but not Bigfoot related. It is a long story. Last year on my new route a drunk driver went off the road and made circles in a farmer's field. A few days later I was told some youngsters made additional circles in other farmer fields. I was told lights had been seen above fields, and this was the motivation of the kids. The police came and demanded that those farmers harvest their crops where they had circles. The farmers were very upset with the demands of the federal government. It seems the feds were worried that news media would spot the circles and make a big deal. 
The day the farmers harvested their crop a policeman from Taney Town, who lives in Westminster, stopped on my route and had me pull in front of his garage. The farmer who had a field behind his home was discharging his rifle in that direction. Eventually, the local police showed up, and I was able to continue on my route. I had a parcel for his home. He claimed that Bigfoot was stealing his corn crop. I was told to leave after dropping off my parcel. Several years earlier, while on another route a farmer had clearly faked crop circles one day. A few days later another set of crop circles appeared. I was told they did not look like fake circles, and was told to harvest his crop. While continuing on my route two customers claimed to have seen a very large Bigfoot. I had reported a very clear sighting of three Bigfoots, many years ago, while lost in the Elkridge area. I attempted to report it to websites in Maryland. About a year later one site responded back and took my report. I told them I might have had other less clear events. They said having a second sighting would discredit my sightings. I've had big cats in my camp several times, mostly just nosing around. Woke up once with a lion, not two feet from my head coughing in that way they do at night. Lions seem to think of tents as solid objects, which is scant reassurance when you wake up with one so close, and just thin fabric between you. Took a while to get back to sleep. Another time my crew and I were camped near a small village, which is helpful because we were within the perimeter that afforded some protection from the village dogs, but not their donkeys. Around 3 a.m. one of them wandered into our camp and, being amorous, bellowed loudly for a girl. In the dead still of night, it sounded exactly like the T-Rex in Jurassic Park. It was so close and so loud. For a long few seconds after I bolted awake, it just rang through the trees. Then everybody in camp in their own tents just busted out laughing. That one I got back to sleep quickly after. I guess this is less supernatural than most, but worked at a wilderness scout camp up in the Sierras and experienced a root fire. I was out with some kids and smelled smoke the base of a tree was smoldering. I figured some kids had been out sneaking a sick but when dug down the side of the base of this huge tree was hot to the touch, and leaf litter around it was smoking. Had some of the scouts run back to HQ, and got people back to check it out. We started digging down, and it runs out the root systems for this huge area of giant trees, had been slow burning burning, and it was just a matter of time until they just started going up like flares from underground. It had spread for a crazy area, and we were basically sighting on a minefield. Still have the scars from the blisters I got digging that day. Jacob cursed as I pushed through the thick underbrush, trying to make my way to the tree stand I had built earlier in the summer. I was certain that this location would give me an optimal line of sight to the neighboring field, where I frequently saw large herds of deer. This is going to be my year, I'm sure of it. I thought to myself as I recalled the events of the day so far. I had awakened at 4.30 a.m., preparing for a long day in the woods on the backside of my farm. My first order of business was to locate and rescue my gloves and camouflaged hunting gear from wherever my wife had hidden them. I would most assuredly need them on this bitter cold November morning. How could it be this cold this early in the year? I wondered as I worked on preparing breakfast that would stick to my ribs throughout the day. After settling on toast, ham, and scrambled eggs, washed down with a large cup of coffee that left a bitter aftertaste, I packed myself a bologna and cheese sandwich for lunch. With my Remington 3006 hunting rifle, a thermos of coffee, and my gear loaded into my truck, I headed out the door. Driving down the one-lane blacktop, road that led to the backside of my property. I turned onto a dirt road gouged with mud-filled ruts. As I ventured about half a mile down the rough road, I reached my desired location. Exiting the truck, 
I loaded my gun and ventured into the wilderness. Navigating about 500 yards into the densely wooded tree line, I began to wish I had worn an extra layer of clothing to shield against the chilly morning air. Despite being only 10 minutes out of the truck, I was already cold. Orsoned by the cloudy overcast day, and the wind blowing steadily through the trees. As I approached a clearing not far from my tree stand, I saw the remains of a large deer. It was a gruesome sight, with a throat torn out, and the stomach ripped open, several internal organs missing. Dread washed over me as I wondered what could have caused such devastation. Despite a sense of unease creeping over me, I continued towards my tree stand. Suddenly, an uneasy feeling washed over me, as if someone had walked over my grave. I felt watched, though I was alone on my property. The forest was eerily silent, devoid of its usual sounds. Convincing myself it was just nerves, I pressed on, reaching the clearing where I spotted the deer carcass. However, my relief was short-lived as a deep guttural scream shattered the silence, filling me with primal fear. My heart raced as I chambered a round in my rifle, turning to confront the source of the terrifying noise. To my horror, there was nothing behind me. Panic rising, I decided to retreat to my truck. But before I could take more than six steps, another scream pierced the air, freezing me in place. With a sinking feeling in my gut, I realized I was not alone. Something was out there, something monstrous and unknown. Running on pure adrenaline, I sprinted back to my truck, my mind racing with fear and uncertainty. As I reached my vehicle, I hastily climbed inside, starting the engine and slamming the door shut. But as I attempted to drive away, I realized I was stuck in a mud puddle, the tires spinning futilely, in a state of sheer terror. I locked my truck into four-wheel drive, punching the gas pedal in a desperate attempt to escape. Suddenly, a deep primal scream echoed through the forest, sending chills down my spine. I turned to see a dark silhouette looming outside my passenger door, a grotesque figure straight out of a nightmare, frozen in fear. I watched as the creature stared at me with red, hate-filled eyes, emitting another blood-curdling scream. Without hesitation, I hit the gas, fleeing from the nightmare that had invaded my reality. My mind raced with questions and fears as I sped away, leaving behind the horror that lurked in the shadows of the forest. Nearly two hours later, the local game warden, Gene, arrived to take our statements. He listened intently, but admitted he wasn't sure what to make of our encounter. There is no animal in this area that fits your description, he said, scratching his head in puzzlement. Frustrated, but determined, Kenny and I spent the next few days warning neighbors to be cautious in the woods. Most laughed it off, dismissing our story as a bare sighting. Only William, who had witnessed the creature himself, took us seriously. Despite our warnings, the attacks continued. Family pets disappeared. Livestock was found brutally mangled and the eerie screams echoed through the night. The atmosphere in the area grew tense as fear spread among the residents. A few weeks later, more neighbors began to believe our story, as the evidence became harder to ignore. Tracks were found, livestock slaughtered, and the chilling screams persisted. Yet, even with mounting evidence, there were still skeptics who refused to accept the truth. One day, as I sat on my porch contemplating the recent events, a cold shiver ran down my spine. My Rottweiler and German Shepherds whimpered and sought refuge under the porch, sensing something ominous. Suddenly, the familiar scream erupted from the forest, sending a chill down my spine. Kenny and I grabbed our guns and prepared to confront the creature once more. As we ventured into the woods, following the tracks and blood trails, a sense of dread hung heavy in the air. We knew we were walking into danger, but we couldn't stand by while our community lived in fear. After hours of tracking, we stumbled upon a creek where the tracks converged with others more of the same monstrous footprints. With a sinking feeling, 
we realized there was not just one creature, but possibly a whole pack, deciding it was best to retreat. We returned home, exhausted and disheartened. Despite our efforts, we were no closer to understanding what lurked in the shadows of the forest. The mystery remained unsolved, and the threat continued to loom over our community, a dark shadow in the wilderness. Days turned into weeks, and life in our small town returned to some semblance of normalcy. But the memory of those harrowing days lingered in the minds of all who had witnessed the horrors of the forest. And as the seasons changed and the years passed, the legend of the creature in the woods became a cautionary tale, a whispered warning to those who dared to venture too far into the unknown. Daphne Fletcher claims that in the summer of 2010, she was living in Wakanda, Washington. She owned most of the businesses in the area, including a ranch, a store, a restaurant or cafe, a post office, and a gas station. After the 2008 or 29 recession, she decided to sell everything and move to Southern California. She employed 10 to 15 people. In the summer of 2010, she sold all of it and celebrated with a bonfire. We had finished. It was the very last night. Everything had just been resolved. We had just sold the place. I had just finished packing everything up with my friend Bill, who lived there with me. All of the furniture was moved out. I just picked up the check from the escrow office. And it was the last night, so we had a celebratory campfire in the fire pit behind the house for the last time. I was really excited already. It was the happiest day, and Bill was excited but sad. We had a nice campfire. And we were going to go over to his mother's house afterward. Because I no longer had any furniture in the house. We finished the fire. We put it out and we were coming around the house and got to the driveway. All of a sudden, just right there. It was just absolutely astonishing. It blocked out the sky. It was so big, and we both just stopped dead frozen, looking up and looking at each other and looking up. Oh my God, oh my God, holy, oh my God, looking at it. Are you seeing this? Oh my God, and just back and forth looking at this astronomically large spaceship hovering above us, just above the trees, and there were two of them, and one was the biggest thing you could possibly imagine in the sky, blocking the whole sky. I could only barely see a little bit on either side, so it was definitely longer than it was wide, and it was facing south, but it was just huge. There was no way something that big could be just in the sky, not making any noise, no ground disturbance, nothing and there was a little triangular right next to it, and they both were just frozen there. It just stayed there planted for, I think, at least a minute. We looked at it, maybe two minutes, and then it just went across the sky poof. Gone. Just whoosh and poof, nothing and gone. We both looked at each other. Did that really just happen? We both were just flabbergasted, but neither one of us was afraid. We just were excited. It was the most exciting thing either of us had ever seen. And the strange thing though, it was much later that night when we got to Betty's house. It was at least an hour, maybe two, hours and a half, longer than what we originally thought. We thought we were going to get there at about 11, and it was like 12.30 by the time we got there. So that was really late and Bill was just beside himself. He was just flabbergasted and Bill was developmentally disabled but he didn't lie or exaggerate, and so his mother. I think she laughed at us at first. But he just couldn't stop going on and on and on about this event. And so I know she believed us by the time it was over, and I stuck it in a box and never talked about it again for years. After that, I left the wilderness. That night was the last there, and I walked away from the experience and just didn't talk about it for years. She eventually moved to Southern California. She underwent hypnotic regression on these two occasions, uncovering an encounter in her youth very vague. Details her entire family was taken from a cabin no date. No location mentioned as well as more details of the 2010 encounter. That night that we saw these ships it turned out that it was just the last minute, 
and that when we were coming around the house we were met. We have lifted up on the ship, and remembering that, it was so strange, but when they put us back down, it was the end of the experience, and that's what we saw when they left. They made me forget that hour before, and I was so amazed and elated to have the experience of coming back to reality and the material world. Bringing this experience with me, I still feel crazy. She later expounded upon the hypnosis, and the things she saw including the fact that the huge ship was actually vertical, though she had no memory of that. I think the most profound thing was that it was so different than what I remembered, and yet it was an extension of the same experience. When I came around the house, I met the three ETS, or extra dimensionals, that were waiting there. They lifted me, and I could see the ship, but it was different. It wasn't laying down. It was standing up, and we were going into the very bottom of the ship, not the side of the ship, it was the bottom of the ship, and it was open and lit up, and it was shining a light down us, and we lifted up into the ship, and then when we came back down, were placed back down on the ground. The whole shift ship shifted and laid down on its side her original memory, and then, when it shot off, it went off like that makes a sharp movement with her hand. Still, it had been standing up straight. I think when it came down, it came down like that moves the hand from vertical to horizontal and so. And then it was just frozen there waiting for us. And that difference in the hypnosis session was so profound. The shift. Because I didn't remember that at all. I didn't feel like I could imagine that part, and it was just so real. It made sense that for it to go that way across the sky, it should reposition itself because if it was standing up, it wouldn't have. I don't know but it just that was the biggest part of that first hypnosis session that really surprised me. She claims that she remembers that Bill was laid down on a gurney-like thing and wheeled into a room while she walked willingly with them through a hall. She believes that she was then shown children who were possibly her hybrid offspring. She claims that she had experienced this before, that she had interacted with the beings previously, and had been shown children, but she did not elaborate on this or any other experiences she might have had. She also mentioned that she had had a few UFO sightings including one in East Sacramento, a boomerang-shaped object. After quite a few drinks, and everyone had gone to bed, I was the last one awake. I decided to go for a pee because alcohol, I find a nice tree, take a piss, and realize a nearby tree is dead and me being drunk thought it'd be a good idea to see how stable it was. It wasn't. I pushed it over, and it made a massive bang as it hit the ground. For some reason I found this exceptionally amusing, and was laughing mechanically as I headed back to camp, apparently hearing a gunshot-like bang and then mechanical laughter, whilst camping in the middle of the bush, is actually pretty scary for the rest of the group. They thought there was a psychotic serial killer was out to get them. We camped in the forest nearby, when we were about 10 or so, and told ghost stories. One of them was about a pack of wolves in the very forest we camped in. They didn't believe me because everybody knows there are no wolves in Denmark. I kept at it though, trying to come up with evidence for it. Finally, I just cupped my hands to my mouth and howled like a wolf. The others just laughed at me until a few seconds later, we heard a wolf howl respond. And another one, and a third. We ran out of the woods back to the house. So fast Usain Bolt would be impressed. Of course, we learned later on that obviously. We were not the only ones camping in there, and some drunk teenagers had pranked us. I was in the army, and it was pitch black. My battle buddy, and I had guard duty at Checkpoint Charlie. We were in a forest, in a temporary camp, I'm sorry. I do not know the English term for it. The time was around 1 am. And while I was looking through our night vision equipment, I could see what resembled four people trying to crawl into our encampment. I followed protocol and called up our guard commander, 
who told me that there shouldn't be anyone out there, but to keep observing them and report back. We were on a drill, and there weren't planned situations this night. I gave the night vision to my buddy, and he saw the exact same thing. Four shapes, crawling very, very, very slowly in the direction of our trenches. So the next step was to stop them. I updated my guard commander about the situation, and what I intended to do. I then got up from our trench, and went to the edge of the camp, with my rifle drawn, and shouted at them to stand up, with their hands above their heads, and identify themselves. There was no response. My buddy looked through the night vision, the entire time and confirmed to me that there indeed were people out there. My guard commander came running down, with his pistol drawn, and looked through the NVG night vision goggles that he had on himself. He confirmed what I saw, and the second he ran out there in anger to confront them, they were gone. They didn't get up and run, they just weren't there anymore. I can't for the life of me explain how, what, and why. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.